We also have been joined today by Simona Hodanova from Nifty Fox. She'll be scribing our meeting. Uh, you see a little uh, one of our participants with a little drawing um, in the corner, and she will throughout the event be drawing what we're talking about and sharing with that with us at the end of the event. So they start to get a flavor of what the discussions look like if they're they are put to picture. Um, we really encourage people to ask us questions. We have three parts to our presentation followed by an open discussion. And at the end of each of the presentations, there'll be a time for some questions. Um, when you ask questions, please introduce yourself, your, in your, your interest in the topic area. Um, and you can also use the chat and we'll try and monitor that well also to pick up questions. Um, and it can also be suggestions, not because yeah, we're really taking all the input that we're getting from this session to really yeah, maximize um, the results uh, that we have and make sure that we make the most of them going forward. So I'd like to start off by introducing our team um, and each of them will introduce themselves uh, in a few uh, moments and then uh, we'll do a little bit of an introduction uh, of the group. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Dr. Stacey Rand uh, from the University of Kent, who is our lead on this project. Thank you, Monique. And in parallel, I'm going to just try doing the slide sharing, which I hope everyone can everyone can see. So hopefully everyone can see the um, slides. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank yeah. you. Do you want so to maybe go? Yeah. Perfect, to sorry. the project team and as Monique said um, I'm the principal investigator for this um, project and I'm based at the University of Kent in the PSSRU which is a research unit focused on adult social care um, and really glad to see so many people who've joined us and who are really interested in this project so I'll then hand over to Alan Hi everyone, yeah, I'm Alan Darling, I'm a research assistant and so at the, the PSSRU um, working with Stacey and I, I work mostly in this project on the uh, literature review stage. Thanks. And so to Lavinia. Hi everyone, um, I'm Lavinia, I'm a co-investigator on this project, I'm a research fellow in public health based at the Brighton Sussex Medical School and I also work with the Applied Research Collaboration Cancer in Sussex and I'm a medical anthropologist by um, training. Fantastic and next we have Karin. Hello I'm Karin Webb, I'm uh, one of the research advisors and a patient and public involvement member. Um, I'm a former carer for my mum and uh, I work with the Applied Research Collaboration for Kent, Surrey and Sussex as I'm their uh, public theme advisor for the dementia theme. Nice to see you all. Good, thank you. And I'm hoping Becky's been able to join us. So if she is here, then um, would you be able to introduce yourself? Hi, Stacey. Yeah, thank you. Just just sneaked in the back door then just before you spoke. So, yeah, I'm I'm Becky Sharp and I'm the implementation lead for our regional applied research collaboration. So supporting the team with dissemination and implementation of the results of their um, uh, research study. Thank you. And back to Monique. Hi, and uh, yeah, I'm Monique Ratz. I'm from the University of Surrey. I'm uh, the food person on the team. I'm a nutritionist by training and have been had a career in doing the social science of food. And it's been a real pleasure to be part of this team uh, working on the topic. I'd now like to uh, introduce a poll. Um, Alan, if you could get that on screen. And this is just to really, yeah, for everybody to get a flavor of who's um, joined us for the webinar. Should be able to see that now. Everyone just uh, multiple choice. There's no limit. And if you need to type your own answer in, there should be a field at the bottom. Of that.
you know, just see a question in the chat, whether the recording of the session will be available to share. Yes, it will. Again, for those that have just joined us, there's a, there's a poll available on the screen now if you could just uh, pop your answers in there. That would be very great. We'll be closing that in a few moments. Would you like to share the results then, Alan? Yep, we'll do. Thank you. Yeah. You should be able to see that. Let me know if not. Yes, so I'm not sure, Monique, if you can see it, but I can yes, certainly. I can. Yes, oh, yes, you can. Yeah, Good. I can. Okay. Yeah, so what we sort of see there is that, yeah, we have a spread, we have, yeah, a large number are care providers, either managers or staff members, 22%, um, dietitians, 25%, uh, researchers, uh, 30%, 31%, uh, family and carers, 9%, social workers, 3%. So, yeah, really nice spread. Thank you for sharing that information. Um, um, it's, it, Monique, sorry, just uh, there's yeah. quite a lot of um, other answers. Yeah. I don't know if you'd like to see those. I can share those. It would mean Stacey mm. um, unsharing briefly. Oh, so I need to briefly stop share screen sharing. I think so. Yeah. Uh. Let me just share this. The other answers, and there's quite a few pages of them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, oh, yeah, that's yeah, great. The why the interest, and we'll summarize those findings and make that part of the report when we uh, release the recording, so that we can, um, yeah, again get a sense of who's interested and why in the results. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And now for the first part of the presentation of the project, uh, we'll have an over start with an overview of the project and, and background. So over to you, Stacey. Thank you. Okay, so I'll just um, share screen again. So hopefully people can see the slides, great. So overview of the um, project. So, um, and a, a lot of this will probably be known to the people um, who are here. Um, it was great to see the range of different kind of interests, and you probably tell from the research team, we're also coming from um, quite different backgrounds. So this is a topic that has lots of deep, different people interested in it, um, but there's a really important reason for that. And if we look at the statistics, it's quite stark that around 1.3 million older adults in the UK are undernourished and that malnutrition and dehydration are major causes of health deterioration. So this can lead to people going into residential care, into hospitals, it can cause health problems and a whole range of other things. And we know that there's quite complex risk factors related to that. Um, experiences that older adults have due to care needs, health conditions, social isolation, challenges in terms of getting to shops and buying food and so on. And all of these things can mean that older adults are at greater risk. But in particular, those using care services, adult social care services are at high risk. And that's related to do with their um, care needs and potentially also social isolation and other related factors. Now, I've got to say that my interest in the topic, I, I'm a social care researcher, so I'm coming from that particular lens um, and I'm interested in adult social care and I've worked on a range of projects with adults with different kinds of needs. But recently I've been doing more work with older adults. And so I'm coming to this 
project thinking through that particular lens. And because of that background, and I'd imagine many of you on the call will share this, that when you're thinking around um, food and drink, malnutrition and dehydration may be important. But also another lens that's really important for us working and thinking about social care is around quality of life. So someone might have a need related to food that means they need to get the right nutrients, they need to make sure they're not being malnourished, but also how are they able to engage with food and access food? Um, so it's thinking about are people able to have the food and drink that they enjoy? Um, are they able to enjoy food with other people if they want to eat socially with others? Is that food appropriate in terms of per personal preference and also culturally and so on? So all of these factors are really important and can Im and do impact on someone's quality of life. And in this, um, community-based social care services play a really important role. And I think here, if we're thinking about England, but other contexts, community-based services can in involve a range of things. A major player is, of course, home care. So that's where care workers are going into someone's home and providing care in that context. But you also have meals services, meals on wheels or related services where people will be taking food to people in their homes but also day activities or day centres where people go to a particular location socially and food may be an important part of that. So all of these services can be thinking around food and drink and there's some great research and I think um, researchers who are working on this some of them are here today it's good to see you. So particularly research around meal services and day centres, there's sort of ongoing work there. But there still has been a gap in looking at the role of home care in particular. And this is an interest of mine that I've looked at over the last few years, but realised that in this particular area, there seems to be um, a, a gap that we don't really have a full understanding from the research literature. And that, I think, is quite interesting and has been part of what's driven this project. So the aims and objectives of our project were to really understand what's already known um, about food and drink needs and outcomes of older adults using home care. Those of us on the team had an intuition that there was a gap. But in putting the project together, we actually had some pushback from people and they were kind of saying things like, oh, we think there's already lots known. So one approach in this topic, in this project, which Alan and Lavinia will talk about, is actually scientifically trying to determine what is already known and better trying to understand where there are gaps and where we already have good evidence and good understanding to influence how we're working in practice and also thinking about policy and decision making. And the second thing we wanted to do with the um, project is, look, we've got some quite nice data, which I'll be presenting on, which can tell us what the profile of needs related to food and drink among older adults is. And that's both now as a snapshot, but also going back in time. And from that data, we can begin to understand what factors are associated with um, unmet needs and also good outcomes for older adults. And um, just as a note, when I'm using the word outcomes, I know this isn't everyone's preferred term, what I'm really talking about is um, quality of life related to food and drink um, that's associated with how care is delivered. So where I was talking earlier, if we can imagine in the context of home care, um, is, is the person able to access food that they like? Is care being delivered in a sensitive way that respects the person's dignity? Are they making sure that they're getting enough food and drink? All of these things together um, feed into this concept of um, food and drink care related quality of life, which I will sometimes in this talk refer to as outcomes, but they're interchangeable. And how we went about this is in three different um, stages. The first one is a scoping literature review, which Alan and Lavinia will talk a bit more about. The second one was analysing a large data set from across England um, that we had access to. And the third was developing a guide to, to the key findings and implications implications of the project, um, which Lavinia will be presenting on um, later. 
So before we launch into the um, next section, just to have a brief pause to see if there are any questions in the chat or any clarifications before we continue. So I'm just going to take a quick look. If anyone's got any questions, please do put your hand up. I'm just looking at the um, chat. There's a comment there from Sophie. Um, this is where personalised care and holistic assessment is so important. Um, in reablement, re we used to look at people's preferences, for example, food choices, time of day, etc., to understand and put a treatment plan in place to reduce the likelihood of malnutrition or dehydration. And I can see a number of people have liked that, and I would absolutely um, agree. As, as you hear the findings and also our directions for future research, actually that focus and thinking around how assessments are conducted um, which sounds in this example to be really good. I think that's a really important area and one way of, um, you know, being preempting and adapting to individual needs. A few other comments here. So often in home care, we're working with the food and drink available in the home. So it's not, um, not that home care is commissioned to do shopping. And also time is a very large part of the issue, especially if funded care packages. And absolutely, as we're going through the presentations where you can see that this is part of our findings and also part of what's driving us with the implications that we're drawing out. So really good comments. And, and we do have someone who's raised their hand. Mm -hmm. um, if you could unmute yourself and ask the question. Someone called Zoom user. Oh. Yeah. And then there's a yeah question. Can you say a bit from um, Simon Shaw? Can you say a bit more about pushback you got as to yeah. whether there was a gap? So this was actually from the anonymous peer review. Um, so we don't know who who gave the comment, but in reviewing the funding application, um, the com there was a comment that there was already a lot known about this topic. Um, and I think as you'll hear in the next section, the scoping literature review, we've actually now gone out and had a look and have a much better idea. So we, do, we don't know who made that comment, um, but it, it certainly was a perception from someone who was invited to peer review our work. So it's in that in itself, I think, is interesting. So if that's OK, I'll, I'll hopefully um, Zoom user, if they do have a comment, will be able to um, add it to the chat or unmute at a later point. Um, but at this point, I'll now hand over to Lavinia, who will take us through the literature review findings. Thank you, Stacey. Thanks. Um, so in the next minutes, Alan and I will talk a bit more about the scoping review, what we did, how we did it and what we found. So um, as Stacey mentioned, the scoping literature review was one of the main um, uh, methods that we used to, to try and, uh, and answer the question of what is already known in the existing literature about the role of home care in supporting the, drink, the food and drink related needs and outcomes of all the people who live at home. In order to do that, we wanted to conduct a systematic search that is a rigorous search that follows specific criteria. Um, and we search all um, existing um, peer reviewed articles that were published in scientific journals reporting on the findings of studies related to the support of home care um, and also, we included grey literature, that is, for example, reports from specific organisations related to the topic of interest. The main, one of the main objectives was to gain an overview of, the, of what literature is out there internationally related to this topic. Another objective was to try and understand what is already known, um, so what is the evidence that this literature has produced, as well as where the gaps are, what is not known yet, what is um, needed for future research in terms of uh, the supports that home care gives to, to older adults in relation to their food and drink needs. 
So these were our objectives, and Alan is now um, going to talk a bit more about what we did in practice. Thanks very much, Lavinia. Yeah, uh, so just apologies, this might get a, a little bit dry, um, but I'll try and keep it as engaging as possible. Um, our final searches were conducted in four databases. Uh, I'll talk about those in a moment. Um, we selected these for complementary breadth of coverage after some pilot searches and much discussion within the research team. Um, our pilot searches explored combinations of different search terms to capture the relevant perspective. Um, with some advice and feedback from the research team uh, and our study advisory group. Based on these pilot searches and some further refinement, we applied a range of terms to capture home care or, or domiciliary care services from the international literature, as well as studies related to food or drink needs and or outcomes. This was important as the topic of this scoping review was likely to bridge across various academic disciplines. Um, so the, the databases we chose were uh, well of science, the science citation index expanded database to give it its full title. Selected to broadly cover literature published in the sciences and social sciences. Um, we also chose psych info to cover social, behavioral and health sciences. Social care index online to capture social care related, uh, including policy information. Um, research briefings, reports, government documents, journal articles, uh, websites, blogs, uh, and also uh, a ProQuest database um, called ProQuest Politics Collection for other great literature. Things such as bodies like Age Concern or, or Age UK, uh, they're, they're kind of yearly reports and, and literature, um, similar to that. Um, we restricted dates to uh, records published from 2000 onwards to identify and identify material most relevant to current policy and practice. Um, where this was not possible, any records published before 2000 were manually removed from the results. Um, there were no language or study design restrictions. Uh, we felt that our search tank would be limiting enough without adding these extra uh, restrictions. No quality standards were applied as well. Um, so the kind of weeding out would happen uh, in, the, in the next stage. Uh, and the original searches were conducted on the 9th and 10th of November 2022, which seems a very long time ago. Um, but we made some supplementary searches uh, on the 30th of January, which has gone to identify any literature published since those original searches. Um, so talking about some of the strengths and limitations, the strengths of the scoping review really included its broad inclusion criteria and use of multiple databases um, to cover the literature from different academic disciplines. Um, the identified literature included studies from many different regions, um, which were pretty easy to spot straight away. Uh, a potential limitation is, however, the diversity of home care international. So broadening our search in that way gave us this, this kind of unanticipated um, extra aspect to deal with. It's diverse in kind of terms of how it is defined, funded, uh, is it public or private insurance uh, and how it operates under the national legislative or regulatory frameworks uh, and the policy and practice guidelines. This influences, for example, the staff entry qualifications, training and skills development and models of delivery that affect older people and their families' experiences. This may have affected the identification of literature despite our broad search terms and also the interpretation and drawing of conclusions, even if we have sought to consider context in our presentation of the findings. Despite this limitation, though, considering all available literature together, we were able to develop a full view of the current international literature and important gaps. Um, would you forward the um, presentation, Stacey? Thank you. So we were looking for studies or reports of primary or secondary research on the food and drink needs of older adults using home care, and we found these 1,877 uh, possible winnings. Uh, uh, and these were shared between the research team and whittled down through uh, by a review of title and abstract to 49 studies, which we reviewed in full text. Of these, only 22 made it through to the qualitative uh, synthesis stage, i.e. Um, being reviewed in full text and analysed thematically using MVivo volume 12. Um, 
via our, our framework, which offered a, a systematic and kind of flexible structured approach to quality analysis. Uh, key information was summarized for each identified article uh, in a chart format, which was developed and tested initially on um, a, a few test subjects. And fields included study type, age and objective, country of study, methodology, whether the study considered home care standalone or combined with other services and any outcome measures used. Um, and that's the end of my bit. I think I'm going to pass back to Lavinia to wrap the mixture and you stand up. Thank you, Alan. So uh, once we have selected the relevant literature, so we selected 22 articles, um, 20 peer review article and two reports, if I'm not wrong, um, we did start analysing them to try and find our um, answer to our question. So um, we, I'm going now to give you a bit of an overview of the main findings from the, the scoping review and um, we broken down and um, the, the main findings in three themes of groups. So the first things that we were interested in um, in looking at, as part of the of the um, overall evidence was how study, the studies that we selected um, defined and framed food and drink needs and outcomes. So what what was the main the um, common understanding of, of these um, of, of, of this um, topic. And we found that the majority of studies that we selected and analyzed used a medical lens to understand the food and drink needs and almost like exclusively a medical lens. That is, needs were understood um, mainly in terms of nutrition or better malnutrition and dehydration. And they were studied because of concerns related to the health deterioration that comes with malnutrition and he dehydration, as well as um, concerns for the cost of um, hospitalization and the overall cost on the healthcare system. So this also means that, uh, for example, there were specific type of measures that were used in this study to um, identify the needs, for example, through weight loss or BMI or a different type of uh, malnutrition assessment. We also found, though, that a smaller number of studies also apply that person-centered care approach to understanding the food um, and drink needs of people that Stacey um, talked about in the introduction. So thinking about quality of life more broadly, not just in terms of nutrition and dehydration, but also about understanding if people have access to the food they like, if the food that they have is culturally appropriate, if there, are, there is respect for, for example, um, uh, personal um, preferences, religious preferences, etc., as well as looking at the socialization around food. So, um, are um, people able to also have a meal with other people, sharing the uh, moment of, of, of lunch or dinner, etc.? But this was a, a smaller group. So, the evidence is there, but it's not as um, broad as we were initially suggested uh, by some um, reviews. The second theme that we were interested in finding and looking at in the, in the existing literature is about what it says about the role of home care. Um, we found that some studies uh, did actually talk and, and had um, looked into the role of home care in supporting um, all the adults who live at home in a person-centered way. And they talk some of the many ways and also the unique ways that home care workers could be um, ideally in a position of support for, for older adults compared to other healthcare professionals um, in many different contexts and regions. Um, um, home care workers, as described as having 
a really good understanding of a person uh, preferences as well of, as of the you know support network around them um, and the and the environmental so for ex conditions so for example how the house look like what is possible to cook what is not possible to cook or store etc so ideally they are in a, in a in this unique position to really um, uh, support people in a person-centered way but at the same time uh, there's also um, acknowledgement in, in these studies of some of the challenges to deliver um, appropriate uh, care and I can see that actually that resonates with some of the comments in, in the chat already so um, one of the main challenge was the very short time of the visit which is often 15 minutes um, and it makes it really hard for people to um, attend to some of the, you know, more kind of social aspects of food or even being able to prepare uh, a, a meal from, from scratch. Um, however, we also found that uh, in many studies, the role of home care was not wasn't specific, exp explicitly considered. So home care was used as an entry point to um, recruit people in the study, or the role of home care wasn't um, included as part of of what was, what the study was trying to find out. And many studies also concluded that the, the, there is a lack of studies that include home care in, 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 um, in, in relation to the food and drink needs of all the people. So this is actually you know, telling us that this is a space where more things needs to be done. And finally, innovation. So we study some, most of the studies that we also look at, but trying to, dis, to, to either evaluate or discuss the possibility of innovative interventions of ways of, of um, supporting these needs with the um, awareness that this is a complex area, this is a complex uh, topic. And um, some studies look at the combination of different types of services and technology. And also there was a um, a focus on the uh, on multidisciplinary work. So the how different um, healthcare professionals, um, care, care workers, uh, home care workers, dietitians, for example, GPs, as well as family and, and unpaid carers can work together to improve uh, the food and drink needs and, and the support for people. However, we also found that um, there is a tendency in the literature not to, to include home care as a, as a space for innovation. Um, again, often home care might have been the place um, to recruit people, but not necessarily to understand the, the role, the key role that home care workers, for example, can play in innovative interventions. Um, so this is something that definitely um, call for more reflections on these. And I would like now to ask if there's any questions, any clarifications, any comments? Sorry, that was me pressing the wrong button. Um, thank you very much, Lavinia. And um, there's been quite a few questions in the chat which I'm happy to go through and if there's anyone else with um, other questions they'd like to um, pose then please do put your hand up and we'll come to you when we're able. Um, there's a an, an great comment here from Jane Easterbrook talking about a project where um, clients were supplied with slow cookers so that the morning staff could put on a casserole or something similar. Um, this was only with a risk asset assessment having been fully completed. And this did seem to work for some people. So that seems to be a really nice, um, you know, quite simple, but quite in some cases, potentially effective um, adaptation or innovation in practice. Don't know if that um, brings any reflections, Lavinia, from the literature. Yeah, I think th there were some examples of, of these types of studies. And, um, 
there's a I think there's a potential there from from the literature. We did see some potential there, especially when all different key actors are included in in developing the the intervention. Um, I think. There are some also, again, like it is a complex area. So, for example, for some people with cognitive impairment or um, it, there's also a, a, a need to, to, to make sure that, you know, someone is there to remind to eat. Uh, and there's also the social aspect of it, of being able to eat with someone that is not always answered through technology or other type of interventions. But it's really good to see that <laughs> happening. Hey, we've got quite a few um, comments. So I'd, I might group some of them or, or summarise. Yeah. So there's a comment from Thomas Morton um, looking at the provision of food and food related activities in community groups. And I think this is confirming what we found that there seems to be a lot about meals in institutional settings, but not so much in community settings. So that's reassuring and sort of does um, amplify our finding about the lack of evidence. Um, a comment from Sophie about commissioning needs to reflect preventative things needed to be and things need to be um, jointly commissioned using data and evidence, um, particularly including personalised approaches and the impact that has on wider systems. So Lavinia, where you were summarising the findings and those bullet points around the narrative around hospitalisation, but also the narrative about person centred care. I don't know if you wanted to kind of add any other reflections around that. Yeah, I think that that's a really good point. We we have discussed also something probably we would also discuss more in later in the presentation about preventative role, um, which is in part is about not understanding food and drink needs just in terms of malnutrition and hydration, although those are really important aspects. But it's also how do we intervene before these needs become higher order needs. And so, yeah, the social and personal this, yeah, structure exactly. it gives to a day as well, those sorts exactly. of elements. Yeah. I thought one other thing that struck me in the results was the sort of uh, relative lack of um, evidence about the cost effectiveness of any of this sort of work. So we're sort of feeling like it's in a very early stage. We have, yeah, what really helps for yeah, coming to decisions about yeah, implementation um, is that there's also economic uh, evaluations and that's something I think we didn't really see so much of. Yeah, absolutely, um, Monique. I think this is one of the main findings that is there is a need for most cost effectiveness research on, on you know, what on, on this type of um, services, community based services and the preventative role. But we also think that in order for that research to happen, there has to be a shift in understanding that they do play a key role. So they have to be included in research. Thank you. And I, I can see other comments and quite a few are sort of around this area of um, some of the challenges. Um, so funding being one of them. So short visits in home care and sort of other impacts, meaning that people are limited. Also, and I think we covered this before, but again, it's here um, around um, care workers having to work with food that's in the house, that there isn't commissioning of services to do shopping or to get food. Um, and also um, a problem, someone's noted here, Jenny's noted that a problem in home care is that some care workers can't cook. So there's something about the skills and training and knowledge um, there as well. So there's a whole range of different things. But I think amplifying what Lavinia said and also Monique, there certainly from the research side, um, if a, one of the problems is funding or how we're organising things, a gap from the research side is good evidence on what works. So what's cost effective, what's effective, and particularly taking that bigger picture view, um, not just around kind of immediate impact um, and looking at malnutrition and dehydration, but also impact on quality of life and longer term preventative. So there's some challenges in doing this kind of work, but generating that really robust evidence can help make the case for funding um, 
you know, extra funding for home care and also thinking around um, changes in practice that might help address some of these issues or concerns. Um, just having a quick look at other comments. If there's any other comments, then please do jump in. I can just see here a, a question from Jenny Nightingale about research um, on Meals on Wheels and sort of the link here. And one of the problems being that the service can be delivered too early or too late for the individual. So I think one of the things about this project is that we deliberately took um, a focus on home care because there are um, other researchers, some of whom I think are here today, who are looking at Meals on Wheels and also other community services, day centres and so on. Um, so, But I think this raises an important question around um, perhaps how services kind of link together and certainly the context in the UK. So if we're looking at the international literature, different countries seem to take different approaches around the mix of services. Um, I, I was about to say in the UK, more specifically in England, the pattern that we're seeing is that there's been a reduction in funding for Mills services. Um, and the expectation has been that home care will step in. But as we've seen in the comments here, we can see that some sometimes that isn't quite working um, because of other kind of limitations, particularly around short visits and so on. And where there are meal services, there can be some issues with those. Um, but I would encourage in the later discussion, perhaps we can broaden it out, but do have a look at the other research that's ongoing. Um, that will probably be under the School for Social Care Research website. And I'll pop that in the chat if anyone wants to follow up. So if that's OK, I think if we um, continue now and thank you for um, additions to the chat, we'll pick those comments up as we're going. Um, I'll then continue with the um, presentation and pick up on the analysis of the adult social care survey, um, which was the second part of the project. So some of you may be familiar with this, but I'm going to take a step back and um, take us through um, bit by bit. So if you've never heard of the Adult Social Care Survey, this is quite an important survey that happens across England um, each year. Um, it's a survey that involves all of the local authorities in England. Um, there's a huge amount of effort that goes into collecting data from all adults using publicly managed social care. And that includes adults um, living in the community, in their own homes, as well as those living in nursing and residential care. And the um, survey goes out to people and involves a number of questions being asked around their experience and their outcomes of receiving care. And one of the sets of questions in that survey that's really important is um, a measure, a questionnaire called the Adult Social Care Outcomes Toolkit, which is often known as ASCOT. And in the picture here, there are eight questions. And in the diagram, it shows each of those um, eight questions that are asked. Um, and, and people are as far as possible encouraged to answer on their own behalf, although we do know about 9% of the responses are completed with um, someone else answering on behalf of the person if they're not able to report for themselves. So the ASCOT covers all kinds of areas which um, from previous research we know are really important to people using social care services. And one of those areas is food and drink. So I'm going to now show you what the question looks like in the questionnaire. So it's question number three, thinking about the food and drink you get, which of the following statements best describes your situation? And there are four statements. I get all the food and drink I like when I want. I get adequate food and drink at OK times. I don't always get adequate or timely food and drink. And I don't always get adequate or timely food and drink. And I think there's a risk to my health. So there, there's something about these questions. Sometimes people say, oh, they're a little bit complicated, but they're designed that way. So this question is trying to do a number of things. Um, but what's at the heart of it is a person's preferences, 
um, what does person-centered care around food and drink look like for that particular person? And you can see that in the way in which the responses are worded. So it's about the food and drink that I like and that I want rather than what would suit somebody else. So this is thinking around the quantity of the food, um, the type of food, the times that it's given, the, and whether it, I feel that it's right for me. Um, and importantly, the very fourth answer does start to tap into when there might be a shortfall in the quality of care that could have a risk to someone's health. And this is based on um, the what we call a capability approach. And um, some people don't like the word capability approach because it, it, it makes people think of whether someone's capable or not. And that's not really what it is. It's a technical term, a philosophical term that's really about enabling people to do and be as they wish. So this is about helping people to live the life that they want to live. So that's the sentiment of these questions and trying to see how far care enables people to achieve that. And in the four responses, you can see in blue on the right hand side, they have um, labels that we give them. So the top statement is someone's living the ideal state. They're living their life as they wish. No needs is um, sometimes we refer to it as it's all right. It will do. It, everything's OK. Could be better, could be worse. The third statement is some needs. And then the bottom one is high level needs. There's a risk to health. And these four statements can be looked um, on their own as a measure of quality of life, or you can further group them. So the top two, you can say that someone's needs are met. It's either ideal or it's OK, but the needs are overall met. And the bottom two statements indicate someone has unmet needs. So these are different ways of thinking about the answers to these questions. So what we did with this project is we actually looked at the data. So this table is showing us the data that we had. Um, and you can see that the adult social care survey has been going on for quite a few years. So the oldest data set we have is from back in 2011. And for this study, we looked at the wave in 2022. And we looked every year as we were going through. The sample involves um, people from across England. And for this study, we extracted people aged 65 and over and those living in the community, so not living in residential and nursing care. And you can see, um, so this is the first column, the sample, invited sample column. Um, you can see that, um, you know, about 70,000, sometimes a bit more, a bit less people were invited. The only exception was the 2020 2021. Um, survey which is circled in blue this was smaller because of the pandemic the survey usually is a, a mandatory survey that all local authorities have to participate in but during the pandemic it became voluntary so a much smaller number participated and they had to opt in so the next column along is you can see who re replied and we know in an ideal world for researchers everyone invited would be really excited and take part, but we know that that's not how it works. But we've had a fairly good response rate, um, around a third. But you can see what's known about these um, surveys is the response rate has reduced over time. And I think that's because when they were new, there was much more energy and excitement. It's been a little difficult to sustain that. But even in the last wave we looked at, we had about 28 28.5% um, response rate, which is um, not brilliant, but not terrible. And from the sample, each, from each year, we were able to look at the answers to these, to the particular question I showed earlier around food and drink. And we looked at those people who rated the third and the fourth response, who were saying they had some kind of unmet need. And we can see just from a quick look at the percentages that the baseline that we started with back in 2011 was 4.3% were saying they had some type of unmet need. And as we go over time, and particularly in the 12th wave where it's circled, it's gone up to 8.1%, which is interesting to notice, to describe. Um, and again, from this, we don't know what's going exactly is going on, but there seems to be a trend of increased unmet need.
And to sort of unpack that a little more, we did look at the differences between those who'd rated some needs and high level needs. And one piece of good news from this is that those with high level needs has remained very low. That's around 1%. So the increase has been those with some, some needs, but that still is a cause for concern. So I think that the first finding from this analysis has been this trend, this descriptive trend, which we think is something that needs attention and needs looking at. And I think previously, certainly from um, other people working on the surveys, it's generally been noted that food and drink is one of the eight questions where there's a very low level of unmet need. So it's quite interesting that we're suddenly then seeing a rise in unmet need. So the next thing that we did was to, as well as describing unmet need, we wanted to understand a bit more about what's going on. So we began doing some analysis where we try to look at the factors related to that unmet need, which might help us to understand and describe what's going on underneath. We were slightly limited in this analysis by what data we had available. So we had the data from the survey and we also had some data that we could link in. Um, but in, in some respects, there were things missing that we would have liked to have considered that weren't there, which I will note as we go through. But things that we were able to look at are things like personal characteristics, so sex or gender, ethnicity, um, health and care needs, um, whether someone's getting help from family and friends, suitability of home design, whether someone's making a contribution towards the cost of care, the year of the survey, and um, rather than individual local authority, we looked at them by um, region, so to give some indication of um, regional differences. So this next slide, if you're not a numbers person, don't panic, I will talk talk you through it. If you're a numbers person, then um, enjoy yourself. And what I would say at the beginning is that this is still an early analysis that's under review. So there might be some further refining or changing, but we can still share these early findings with you. And these are the findings for the rating of unmet needs. And you can see in the very first column, some of the numbers have stars. And those stars are telling us where there's a significant association, so something interesting going on. So to talk you through the key findings, what we found is that personal characteristics do seem to be related to unmet need. So men were less likely to report unmet need, but um, people who were reporting ethnicities other than whites um, were more likely to report unmet need. And I would add here that ethnicity is one of those data areas where we were limited. Unfortunately, the data set that we had only had the categories white or other. Um, we didn't have any further granularity, which is um, a shame, but something that we can note and hope that can be addressed in other data collections or future ways of looking at the data. So there's something about individuals' characteristics that's going on. Um, another finding was around region. So there seems to be higher um, unmet need in London boroughs, particularly inner London. And in trying to think and reflect around what might be going on here is we know that um, local environments and food, um, ability to actually get to food um, might be important and also potentially cost of living, impacts of living in London. So we're wondering whether these might be driving some of those regional differences. But certainly what we're seeing here is interesting and I think would give an indicator for future research. And if there is future research, including London boroughs and trying to understand better what's going on would be certainly something we'd recommend. Unsurprisingly, um, where people are reporting difficulties, um, with eating and drinking and also um, high levels of care need, um, they're more likely to report unmet need. And you'd expect to see that in there. And we were including that in there to control for it. Um, and again, from other findings, knowing that someone has a home that meets their needs is important. So if a person's home is not meeting their needs, they're more likely to report um, unmet 
um, food and drink needs. So these are simple things is can a person get around the home? Can they access the kitchen? Can they use it correctly? So these sorts of things. And again, not, not a wholly unsurprising finding, but this is important for us thinking in a more holistic and linked up way and um, that social care and things like housing and adaptations of housing are linked together. These do together impact on people's quality of life. The next one along is around um, care from family and friends. And what this is showing is that having someone who's helping you, who lives with you, means you're less likely to report unmet needs. So this is really showing the, um, as much as in this study, we're wanting to look at the impact of home care. This is also showing the positive and really important contribution that family members make. But the thing, and I hope this will come out in the discussion, um, this is good to notice here, but important for us to consider because there is then um, impacts on those family members as they're stepping in and picking up um, this support and this care. There can be sometimes negative consequences for their own quality of life and well-being, which we were not able to look at in this study, but would be interesting con to consider in other studies. Then we looked at um, contributions or topping up of care. And um, what we found here was a little bit counterintuitive, um, but we, we found that if someone wasn't um, adding to top up of care, that they were less likely to report unmet needs, which you might think is slightly around the wrong way. But we're wondering maybe what we're picking up here is um, people's behaviour. So if their needs are already met, then would they then be purchasing additional care? But I think, again, this is an area if we had better data and ability to dig in, um, this does look like an interesting area to look further. Proxy reports. So those who had someone report on their behalf were more likely to report unmet needs. And again, what we were not able to consider was cognitive impairment. And we wonder whether um, that's related here. And there have, and including in our literature review, there have been some studies looking at the needs of people with dementia, cognitive impairment. And again, that's another area um, to focus on. So having looked at all of these, once we've considered all of these different factors and controlled for them, um, if we then add in survey year, so that trend we looked at earlier, what we're doing here is saying, is that trend still significant once we've controlled for everything else? And the brief answer is yes. So even if we control for all the other things going on, there does seem to be an increase in unmet need over time. The one anomaly is the 2021 survey that was the pandemic voluntary survey. That's the only one that doesn't show that increase. But we think what was going on there is that local authorities were opting in and those that opted in, um, it's a self-selecting sample. So we're not getting a full picture. So once we've once we'd run that analysis all very well and good, but we realised that we were missing, missing something from that first run of the analysis I've just shown. And the important thing that we're missing is some kind of indication of the amount of care someone's receiving. So we think about it as an equation, which might be a slightly funny thing to do, but bear with me. So if we're thinking of um, someone's quality of life, their outcome as a function of how much care they're receiving, the quality of the care, the, the type of needs that they have, and also individual characteristics. We need to consider all of those things to get the full picture. And as I said, the one thing that we were missing from that first analysis was how much care they were receiving. Now, sadly, the data set doesn't include, the adult social care data set available to researchers doesn't include any indicator of that. So we had to find a workaround. So the workaround that we did was to look by local authority and work out the average intensity of care that they give to older people within that local authority. And because of the approach that we took, the data availability, we couldn't go right back to 2011, but we could go from 2015 to 2022 and then include it and rerun the analysis. And the results were very similar, but with a couple of differences. So interestingly, we found that ethnicity was no longer significant. 
which um, again in itself is an interesting finding and probably needs a little bit more um, understanding, particularly around the associations between um, region and um, local authority spend and ethnicity. Um, we also found that um, there was privately purchased care with own and family money was more likely to have unmet need, which might be reflecting something to do with the negotiation that happens if someone's contributing their own and money from family members. But the important findings were that the trend over time was still significant for the last round of the survey, the 2022. So that rise that we saw up to 8.1% um, unmet need was significant. But oddly, the pandemic year had significantly lower unmet need, which again, I think we're caveating because it was a voluntary survey. And finally, the average intensity of um, care per person by local authority was significant, so less likelihood of having unmet need. So the, the two key, th if you take nothing else away from this, the two key things are that there has been a trend, an increase in unmet need. So this is something where we really do think there needs to be some attention. And if maybe for years we thought we don't need to worry about it because it's a low percentage, we do now, I think, because we're seeing it's increasing potentially for a whole range of reasons. But the other one is that investment in care, you can see the impact that um, higher investment in care, intensity of care per person within a local authority, people are less likely to be reporting unmet need. And although this doesn't quite have the gold standard of a uh, randomised control trial or a full experimental study, this is demonstrating the kinds of methods that could be applied in those sorts of studies, which would generate the kinds of evidence that we were talking about earlier, which I think is important. And I, th I think I've, again, reiterated some of these summary points and conclusions in the previous slide. Um, but to add around further analysis, um, so as I was going through, I mentioned that there were some limitations and those limitations were due to us using data that was already collected and having to adapt around what we had. But um, what we really hope in the future is that there will be new possibilities with better and more complete data. So I'm just going to pause there. Thank you, Stacey. There's a few questions in the chat. And one is, do commissioners use this survey to plan services? Um, I can't answer for the whole of England, but the data is definitely there. And we know that some commissioners are using it. Yes. And if there are any commissioners here, then um, if you do use it, please do say. And yeah, there's a comment about overlaying a cost-deprived neighbourhoods that would be helpful to do. Um, and again, with the data set, we're limited. The um, geography was only by local authority. If we could then dig down deeper, that would be really interesting. And then a comment from Sophie Waring. This is important data because often utilising family members is seen as a solution to unmet need, but isn't sustainable. This needs to be fed back into the commissioning services of services, as well as linked with care support services. Absolutely. Would absolutely agree with that. And in yeah. some of my other work, we have had linked data. It just wasn't available here. And I think that usually is really important and very interesting when you look together. Yeah. And I think, yeah, to do that in this space on this topic. Um, I'm a bit mindful of time. Just checking, have we got... Yeah, and there's some comments around the, yeah, the purchasing of private care um, and how that links into this. So again, yeah, pointing to that complexity here of getting the right services in, space, in place. Mm -hmm. And I don't see any raised hands. I'm thinking, yeah, in the being conscious of time, if we sort of move to the next part of the presentation, which is about developing the guide um, to the key findings and implications. Thank you, Monique. Yeah, so I'm going to try to be quick, but we wanted to share a few reflections um, that we have developed uh, as a team while working on the uh, guide to the key findings and implications. So how do we 
um, um, talk about the, the, the key findings, how do we identify the key findings and who is our audience? So I think what is, is clear, um, next, next slide, please. Um, so what is clear so far is that the, 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 this is a complex um, topic that needs the attention of many different actors. Um, and so the, the reflections that I'm going to, um, to, to talk about uh, comes from the fact that in the last months of, of the project, we have worked together uh, with um, our public advisors as, a, as well as advisory group uh, members to develop this guide to key findings and uh, implications. And some of the, um, it, th this guide has also been shaped from some of the feedback, co comments and questions that we have received when presenting the study in different conferences over the, the project um, life. So um, next slide, please. So the first question that we we needed to, to answer is um, wh whose interest matters? So this study, um, the topic of this study, as, as um, Stacey um, talked about in the introduction, came mainly from, from, a, from a social care perspective. And of course, um, the, the interest is uh, of, of you know, people who use um, the services is, is, is the main interest. But, and the topic was also identified as the priori priority through engagement with the Applied Research Collaboration Cancer in Sussex Home Care community of practice. So again, the focus is very much on home care and social care services, other social care services. And we do bring that lens quite heavily in this project. So we are talking about quality of life. We are talking about food and drink needs, which is a language that is used in social care. So of course, this is a, it's a topic of interest for older adults, carers, care providers, commissioners, local authorities, but it, I think it's clear now that the topic is all, also relevant to, to other sectors, to, to other actors. So for example, hair care professionals, GPs, dietitians. It's also about public health, it's about access to food, it's about inequalities in access to food, and it's about healthy aging, which is a public health topic. And it's about the voluntary and community sector, thinking about Meals on Wheels, food banks. These are all um, services that do provide the important um, part of, of what is accessing food. For example, food banks and, and uh, community pantries, for example. So um, next, next slide, please. We also then had to really think about how do we frame the topic? Because each sector is each person, depending on their role, has a bit of a different way of talking about this, of, of um, framing the issue and using different type of language. So we found that there are different frames at play here in how food and drink needs are understood. And we ident identified three main frames of lenses that people use to, to, to look into and understand the, the issue um, and the topic. So the one that we used was the social care one that talk about quality of life and really think about caring. Now, here you see task. I understand this is not the best but, uh, um, term to use in social care, but this is not about understanding social care as, as a task based uh, service, but more understanding that food and drink needs are understood as something that we do in practice. So it's about, you know, um, caring about someone and being responsive to their needs in a specific moment. So it's also about being open to what is there to, you know, those house conditions and the food that is in the, in the kitchen already and being able to, to support them with that. The other lens that we found that is that of, of medicine, is the medical lens that we have talked about earlier. So thinking about food and drink and needs as, as through the lens of nutrition, hydration and illness. And this is understood as natural processes. 
So the quality of life, language, and lens is not necessarily at play here. And the next um, lens that we identify is that of public health, which is about healthy eating, which is thinking about food uh, practices and, and drink practices as something that is an individual choice. That is at the moment the, and also thinking about poverty, so food poverty, um, economic up, um, uh, possibilities around accessing food. But we also see that there is an issue not just about food poverty, but also care poverty. And this is not necessarily, again, the language and the lens that is used in public health. However, the topic that we are discussing here today is relevant to all these different lenses and people who work in medicine, in public health and social care. So finally, um, next slide, slide, please. It was about how do we convey this complexity in our uh, find key findings and implications. So it is now clear that food and drink needs of older adults are complex. It's about food poverty, but it's also about care poverty. It's about individual needs that are can be health related, for example, um, cognitive impairment or other type of illnesses and comorbidity is about mobility, etc. It's also about the local env environment. So it's about being able to access not just food, but food outlets. Is there enough transport? Um, to, to get to the shop. And it's about the wider economic context that shape all these different um, aspects. And so we suggest that a system level perspective in, is needed. And probably one of the key um, implications is that th th there has to be a reframing of the discourse, that it is attentive to the medical aspect, to you know, nutrition and hydration, but is also um, attentive to the social benefit that a quality of life approach has for all the people and carers, and trying to keep the two together. So I would now like to pass it over to Karin for some final reflections about the complexity of the topic. Thank you, Lavinia. Um, yeah, speaking as, as a former carer for my mum who had uh, vascular dementia, uh, she lived in a council house and she was social services funded. And because social services knew that I, I didn't live with mum, but I lived across town about 10 minutes away. Um, she was funded on the two days that I worked part time uh, for 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes in the evening. And um in that time, the uh, professional carer had to give her breakfast, give her medication and go on to the next 20 people that they, that they had on that day. So um, my my thing is, if um, if mum didn't have me and all these other people that don't have a carer or a family friend to look after them, if all they're looking after is looked after is for 15 minutes, um, it paints a very bleak picture because um, nobody actually then checks on whether that person has ate the food that has been left. Um, I obviously came across to, was there to check mum had eaten it. Sometimes she might take um, half an hour to an hour to eat what was left. Nobody's got that time if they're um, a professional because they're too busy going on to their next person. Also, um, after my mum passed away, uh, I went on to um, work on with people that uh, lived with dementia and ran groups for them. And what we've heard before, it's all about people's quality of life. So that person living at home with no carers, potentially uh, family carers, may be going out to um, a group once a week because they want to eat with other people. And I think that is one of the things that is, is overlooked um, when uh, any commissioners listening is overlooked because it's the social aspect that makes people want to eat and drink a, a little bit more. If one one of their friends is eating, oh, this is this is nice, Bob, you know, have a little bit more. Of it. Oh, is it? And it, it, it just encourages other people to I, I saw it um, definitely. And, and even when my mum had somebody that when later on she was had a half an hour visit and 
it also depends on whether you're getting the same professional carer coming in as to whether that relationship is established with the person that is is being looked after to see whether they are eating and drinking if you've got an, um the same carers coming in on a regular basis then you're more likely to be able to tell whether that person is drinking adequately um what their f future needs are if they need to be funded a little bit more but if you if you've got um uh what you call it, a roundabout of carers and you're not getting the same carers and nobody's talking to each other that's where the problem also lies it, it's such a a complex thing because mum also had meals on wheels um came round um on the two days that I was work wasn't working and we we could list what her pre preferences were for the, for the food and one day they didn't have what she wanted on board for some I don't know why and she was given a salad and when I, and mum hated salads so when I came back from work and mum hadn't eaten because she said oh they left me a salad I said what about the lasagna that you wanted she said oh they didn't have it so that's another thing you know that person that's on meals and wheels lovely but they're only there for five minutes drop drop the meal and off they go so my mum had me to know that she hadn't eaten but if somebody's living on their own who have they got they haven't got anyone so it, it's just all about um when, when i was um helping with the guide um we we found that the role the role of home care should be valued more because there's a lot of um the underinvestment on that on that aspect of it is really false economy because it could lead to somebody getting um uh, much more poorly you know especially with people with dementia their tastes change and they might um well food that they once liked they might not be able to eat anymore because there's lumps in there they don't like the lumps anymore the textures who's actually checking on that who is liaising with another professional to see oh we're we're we check on that we do something about that and i think so much emphasis is put on family and friend carers to do that and that's great if the person has got a family and friend carer what happens if they haven't um and i do think it's collaboration with other professionals uh, as well as family carers if they have them is is of vital importance um and also that commissioners we found need to fund community-based care services rather seeing rather than seeing where cuts can be made um, because I had one man come to um, a group where I worked he literally just came to eat with other people he didn't come to play the games and, and all that he just wanted to eat with others and then when he'd eaten he was so happy that he'd been with other people shook my hand thank you very much off he went until the next day you take that away which they have in my area what's happened to that man who's checking up on him um i just thought that's a few of my my personal reflections and i know time's getting on so i will hand over to to monique thank you very much thank you so much karen it's been so helpful to have you as part of the team to continuously yeah help us reflect on what are the most key things that we need to bring out and to, to have you yeah, tell the story again from personal experience as well is very valuable. We've had quite a lot of comments, I think, echoing yeah, what both Karen and Lavinia have just been talking about. I'd like to use a little bit of the time to give um, Simona Hodner Hodnovova time to sh share the uh, drawings that she's done to play back to us the discussions. So over to you. Uh, thank you, Monique. Um, so I've been trying to capture all the ideas and all the information that we shared during the session. So thank you to everyone who kind of took part in this and helped me to illustrate what, what's been said. There is still a few empty spaces because I'm still working on it, as you can tell. Um, but for example, from the key findings, we mentioned things like developing guides, how individual needs are very important, then whose interests matter, mentioned social care, support services, food banks, public health. We also mentioned that caring and support is very important. And also 
not only nutrition and hydration, but also social aspect of things and, and how uh, people are not being taken care of for long enough of time. So, for example, the visits from social carers can be only 15 minutes. There is no one to check on people who don't have family members coming to check on them. And also we talked about how social interaction is very important in terms of people wanting to eat more, want to socialize, and it has a different aspect to things as well. I'm not sure if you want me to share the previous screens as yes, well. Yes, please. That would be wonderful. Perfect. I'll be just a second. So then we had presentation from Stacy where she talked about how the survey is helping to collect data and how the questionnaire works. It's talking about quality, times of eating and food quality. It's on different levels. Then we also talked about how there is a uh, the responses decreased, but overall unmet needs increase over time. Then we also talked about how men are less likely to report unmet needs, how people from different ethnic backgrounds are more likely to report unmet needs. And then also family members who are helping people are also less likely to report those problems. Um, then we had, oops, sorry. Then we have presentation from Ellen and Lavina, Lavinia, sorry, um, where we talked about systematic research, search, peer review. We talked about trying to find out what's out there and where's the gap. Uh, we mentioned some strengths and limitations. We also talked about the key findings, which were medical lens, quality of life, role of home care, which was used as an entry point and that it's important to work together. Then we have some questions and answers from uh, people who attended. So we mentioned the um, safety of, for example, using slow cooker. We talked about the social aspect again, when eating with someone is very important. Economic evaluation, again, short vis visits, as we mentioned previously, and service delivery and how there is lack of funding as well in this area so yeah yeah that's thank you for sharing all those thoughts and presenting everything it was really interesting topic so i really enjoyed working on this with you so thank, thank you. you so much yes and thank you everyone for so being so active in the chats um Stacy has also shared the details where you can find um, what's available now in terms of our reports and um, publications. Um, so the links are in the chat. But I don't know if there are any comments or questions people would like to make. And I'm yeah, very much we're very much appreciating the suggestions on who to make sure that we get our results to. Um, there are many suggestions that have been made. And uh, yeah, an interesting comment here around, again, the link with transport. So not um, getting people to places either to eat food or to buy food. And so again, showing the integration of services. Um, and uh, that I have another project where we were working with a transport service, uh, a uh, social um, a community organization who didn't see themselves as a food and drink organization, and then really realized that a lot of the business that they um, had was taking people to places where they would be able to share food with others. And that made them really think about themselves as an organization quite differently. Um, so yeah, food being a social glue for um, life, I think has come out of lots of people's comments here. And just, just to add as well, because I've been trying my best to respond, but there's been so much chat, but it's great. Thank you everyone for kind of comments, suggestions. Um, there's been a few around how we're sharing the findings. So just to fill in some gaps, we've obviously got the event today, um, as well as um, I've shared the link, we've developed a guide We've got the um, drawings that Simone has produced, so different ways of sharing this. We have um, actually had some opportunities to present this with people involved in policy. So we've had one forum where we've managed to do that so far, um, a formal forum, and also informally at events where researchers have been brought together with policymakers. We'll be continuing sharing the results um, through any forums, but if anyone's got any contacts or ideas of 
where we could be sharing this, then please do let us know. Um, I've shared in the um, chat the link to the guide and also our website. Um, so please do, they're publicly available. So please do have a look and also share them on um, through networks. We're very keen to get this um, out to people who need to hear it. So thank you for your help with doing that. And the drawings will also be um, available. That was one of the questions. Yeah. yeah. Right. Any other questions that people have? Yeah, thank you so much for also the uh, the comments of um, encouragement. We as a team are yeah, going to be thinking about what next in terms of um, the work that we're doing and taking this forward. So again, really open to people getting in contact about any thoughts to do with that because it's a space I think that we're all still very excited about working and continuing to do work in. Wonderful. So thank you very much for attending and uh, look forward to, yeah, connecting where possible and uh, have a good rest of